Explorers Club. Explorers Club. Explorers Club. The Explorers Club. So uh, are you ready to go? Recording? I'm recording. Go. Okay. Yep. We're talking about mummies and mums the word. So uh, <laughs> so we're going to go ahead and try to cover this topic as much as possible. Uh, so uh, puns aside, uh, we jump right into it. We're going to go into the uh, first, the evolution, a short talk on the evolution of mummification uh, in ancient Egypt. And then from there, we're going to go into all the details of the process, although we'll do a little bit about that earlier uh, as well. So the term mummification uh, is inclusive of both the preservation of the body, the applications of techniques to keep the body as much as possible in its original form, and the rituals involved in this process. Uh, somebody needs to turn their mic off. So. Please, thank you. Once again, mummification uh, is inclusive of the needs audio with of the video body. like this. The application of techniques to keep the body as much as possible in its original form and rituals involved in this process. So we will cover all three of those aspects. Now, as early as 5000 BCE, uh, Egyptian bodies were wrapped in matting with their bodies tightly flexed, which basically means that the legs are bent and folded up all the way up to the chest. And they were originally buried with grave goods, uh, which obviously reveals the fact they believe in the afterlife. Um, there are, in some cases, signs of dismemberment, um, especially the cutting off the head. Um, this is this is this is common. Uh, earlier on, the idea is is that if you cut off the head, it's not going to come back to life in this life. <laughs> it keeps uh, keeps you staying dead. Uh, and, and of course, in other cases, it'll cut off the feet, uh, so you just can't go walking around. Uh, so already, you're seeing through these indications that people are believing uh, in an afterlife. But I think they're wanting to make the afterlife, you know, the afterlife as opposed to them coming to life in this life and causing any problems, hence the cutting off the heads and in some cases, the cutting off the feet. Uh, they don't want any zombie situation going on here. Okay, so what will happen is, is that um, the orientation of these early graves um, uh, was facing towards the west, towards the setting sun. So not yet the rising sun uh, by this point. Uh, the early graves were rather shallow, uh, so their heads are pointed to the west. Uh, of course, eventually that will change. Now, because the bodies were buried uh, in these very shallow graves, directly in the grave, uh, directly to in the ground, uh, the salty sand uh, was able to surround the body. Uh, and the heat of the sun was not too far away. Now, if you guys know anything about preservation, uh, what this would do is this would preserve somewhat these bodies 
early on. Uh, that that would mean that um, uh, you know they would uh, you know maybe forgetting that they buried somebody somewhere, probably not, and they would accidentally disturb the grave, and they would realize, hey, um, there's still there's still meat on there, they're still juicy, right? Or what happened a lot or too much because we know that later on we have curses against this. You'll have jackals and other kinds of animals uh, that will <laughs> uh, go in there and go, ooh, this is great. <laughs> Preserve meat for us to eat. Uh, this is still a problem today uh, in certain uh, places of the world, unfortunately. Uh, animals get hungry. In fact, animals, uh, lots of dogs and so forth, they just love, uh, they just love bones. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you one story uh, at the Spodra Cemetery up in Pomona. Uh, they were having problems recently because some um, homeless people moved nearby. It's 19th century cemetery, uh, and they had some pit bulls. And these pit bulls uh, went around and they dug up corpses, and they kept finding femurs and other parts of bones that they would be lying on. Uh, and that was within the last decade. So yeah, dogs like bones, animals like bones, uh, and there are reasons why they're going to change this practice. But what they did observe. Uh, is the fact that it was preserved. But as time goes on, uh, there's a change. Uh, the change is around 3,700 BCE. Wow, I'm giving you exact dates. 3,700 BCE, uh, the graves became larger, larger, they became deeper, and they were protected by walls of brick and mud. So this would isolate the bodies. Well, something happened pretty quickly. They realized that when they accidentally or intentionally opened up the grain, that the bodies were not as juicy, they're not as preserved, and in fact, they had decayed because they had been removed from the shallow, salty uh, soil. And so they started making the generality, I am sure, what are we doing wrong? You know, uh, are the spirits, are they upset with us? Because, hey, before the bodies were preserved, uh, and now suddenly they're not. And uh, so what's interesting, because within a century, uh, they start the preservation strategies. So, uh, so 3,700, you have the deeper graves that are surrounded uh, by these mud brick walls. 3,600 BCE, suddenly it's like, hey, Maybe we should uh, practice some preservation. Okay, and the earliest extent of discover, discovery of this is at a place known as Hyra Canopolis. Uh, so Hyra, Holy, um, Aka, Ak, uh, and Apus City. Uh, and we find the graves of three women, each with their necks and arms wrapped uh, in fine linen that is soaked in resin. Uh, one of them had an organ removed that was then wrapped in linen soaked in resin uh, and placed back into the body. Of course, uh, the significance of trying to keep uh, various organs preserved may have been connected to the idea of feeding the dead. You know, you know, so, you know, you know oftentimes uh, you see throughout the Middle East and in uh, the uh, Obviously, Northern Africa, you're going to see a practice in ancient times where you, well, even, even in other places, East Asia, where you feed the dead. And the, the thought started to go about, well, you know, you need to have some kind of organs to be able to keep receiving this food that we're giving it so it can continually nourish uh, itself into the afterlife. Are you guys getting this? So, so the organs start to become important when it comes to preservation. Uh, resin, of course, uh, many of you know, derives from plants. Uh, basically, it's sap. <laughs> uh, and of course, uh, you, you cover uh, these bandages with sap, and it acts as a seal. Uh, these uh, resin uh, uh, soaked wrappings will continue to be in use for the early part of mummification during the first and second dynasty in Egypt. So roughly between uh, uh, basically 3,050 to 2,700 BCE, this is the kind of modification you're going to get. But then things start to change. Um, 
now uh, I just want to bring this up uh, briefly. They start making uh, especially uh, for those uh, who are um, wealthy. They start creating raised uh, structures. These raised structures are known as a mastaba. And uh, they're, they're, so now the body for the wealthy, you know, kings and nobility and so forth, they're no longer necessarily in the ground. They are raised up uh, into these mastabas. Uh, of course, and of course, they're actually were called mastabas. That's a uh, that's that's actually an Arabic word. Uh, they are actually called pre-dij, uh, pre-dij, which means house of eternity. And uh, what is interesting with this is now they're lifted up, and you have two chambers. One chamber is reserved uh, for the body of the king or the noble, and the other chamber is reserved for all their goodies. And it's still in this heightened area. Eventually, of course, uh, people start becoming competitive, nobles, you know, pharaohs, and so they keep making their mastabas bigger. Uh, this is one of those Freudian moments in the time, you know, so it's like, it's like, hey, you know, the next, next successor, his mastaba is big, and the other one goes, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna make my mastaba twice as big. And so you're seeing this competition going on, and they're getting bigger and bigger. And finally, of course, uh, you're gonna have, um, uh, well, they're gonna go. Well, yeah. What we're gonna do is I'm gonna I'm gonna stack one mastaba on top of another, on top of another, and on top of another, and then you'll have, of course, that will turn into what's called the step pyramid. <laughs> uh, so it just basically mastaba is all placed on top of each other. Uh, pretty easy there, you know. Uh, and and then what happens is that uh, I won't go too much into it, but uh, uh, by the way, uh, Dozer uh, was the one who is connected with the step pyramid. Uh, and you're going to have, obviously, Imhotep is going to be the one who designs it. Uh, it can mean many things, but we're not talking about pyramids today. I just want you to understand this is part of uh, the development. Uh, I do want to mention uh, maybe uh, a funny story, uh, and that is uh, a pharaoh by the name of Guri. Uh, he, he tried to make a, uh, a pyramid, a step pyramid, and he didn't, he didn't make it very well, and the steps were too close in succession. And he didn't use enough mortar, and so it started to crumble. And so the next pharaoh named Sneferu, always picture Sneferu, he's got a big nose, you know. Sneferu, he, he says, oh, yeah, well, I got I to gotta brace up this pyramid because it's falling down. And it became the true pyramid. Anyway, here we go. I'm just ruin the pyramids for you. Uh, we know their names. We know the names of the architects. Uh, you know, so you mean the true pyramid was a result of uh, the, the step pyramid starting to fall apart and it's supposed to brace it from yeah okay well that's so much for the mystery uh, and then of course uh, uh what happens is Sneferu goes ahead uh and he makes three different pyramids to, to try to perfect it and those all three of those pyramids still stand to this day uh it's like trial and error uh constantly uh he makes the what's what's called the bent pyramid which is a it's at a 54 degree inclination but suddenly proceeds to a sharper and shallow angle of 43 degrees at the top, making it literally bent because he realized that at that angle, the thing's gonna collapse. So he gave up on that one. I mean, he finished it, but, oh, I wanna do another one. So he created what's called the medium pyramid. And this is the idea of making a step pyramid and then covering it up with, uh, with the limestone uh, supports. So it all hold together. Like, hey, you know, it, you know, it worked once, why not work it, make it work again? And unfortunately, it didn't make it very well, and the sides all slid to the side. So you can visit that today, and you'll see that uh, just like this eroded mound with a bunch of blocks around it. And finally, he figured out, wait a second, 54 degree angle doesn't work. 43 does work, because that's the way we did the top of the bent pyramid. And so what he did is he made a pyramid that's all the way 43 degrees. That's called the red pyramid. It still stands to this day and has the original outer part. Isn't that interesting? So when people say how pyramids are made, and it took you know, thousands of years. No, they did not. And we have one a, a pharaoh, Sneferu, who not, not only made one pyramid, he made three in trial and error, and one still, they actually all stand today, and you can find them. Okay, well, meanwhile, of course, mummification. Uh, of course, the next big uh, uh, pyramids will be obviously the Great Pyramids. 
And that brings us back into the conversation of mummification. So around, uh, uh, first of all, around 2600 BCE, uh, what will happen is the Egyptians, uh, they realize that intact organs result in a faster rate of decomposition. And so the first organs in special containers now, special containers, dates from the reign of Khufu, uh, 2589 to 2566, uh, who is, of course, the famed builder of the Great Pyramid of Giza. So, the, so and uh, we don't have Khufu, but we have his mom, <laughs> uh, Hetaphiris the first, and uh, basically uh, they placed uh, her lungs, stomach, liver, and intestines in a chest that has four chambers. So uh, there you go, I'll say it again. Lungs, stomach, liver, and intestines. Okay, so in a chest to have four different chambers. Eventually, they'll move away from this idea of having a chest and they'll put it into four different jars known as canopic jars. But at first it was a chest and then it became, uh, it became the various jars that will have the lids of the heads of, of Horus's sons. But uh, we're not there yet. Meanwhile, uh, they are working uh, continually on trying to preserve the body a little bit better uh, around this period of time. Uh, what they thought to themselves is, okay, we're going to obviously wrap the body in bandages. We'll soak it in resin, right? But in addition, they thought, you know what we're going to do? We're going to hollow out the body. We're going to just kind of hollow it out. So we're removing the organs. We're going to put them somewhere. I'll tell you the various options in a moment. But we're going to hollow out the, the entire of the body, except for one organ that seems to always stay in. Can anybody tell me what that organ is? They always seem to keep in the body. Um, we'll give you a hint. Right? Lung, stomach, liver, and intestines are taken out. What organ is missing? The, the heart. heart. The heart. That's right. That's Straight right. into the heart. Okay, anyway, yes, uh, the heart, it stays in there. Because uh, you got, it's, it has to stay in there uh, because it's connected to the metaphysical hip uh, and it has to be weighed in the afterlife. So that heart has to stay in your body. Everything else is taken out. But, uh, it kind of gets you right uh, right here, doesn't it? Okay, so what will happen, you're going to see lots of jokes like this, so I better stop uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, what will happen is they start wrapping, uh, taking out the, sorry, the, the, taking out, clearing out the body. And then what they do is is they, they get uh, uh, rags that are stuffed in resin, and they fill up the, the, the body itself. So they clear everything out and they put rags soaked in resin inside the body. Now, in some cases, uh, what they will do is they will put the organs, except for the heart, in first the chest and then into jars. But in some cases, they will also take the organs, wrap them separately, and put them back into the body. But they make sure that they are separate from the actual body itself, they don't want it touching because they realize that decomposition that's involved in the organs spreads to the rest of the body. It's the old story that uh, your, your last meal often makes a meal of you afterwards. Think about it, you know? Everything that you had uh, will become nice and lively after you pass on, uh, and it will be consuming you from the inside out. Yeah, fun stuff. So uh, there are reasons why they keep things uh, sold separately. Okay, okay, moving right along, uh, trying to, attempting to. At this period of time, uh, by the fifth and sixth uh, dynasties, so roughly between 2500 to 2022 uh, BCE, uh, bandages were now finally fit, fitted on the body from head to toe. 
uh, once again, covered in um, um, uh, resin. And they kind of put some plaster over it to seal it. You know, basically nothing has happened. Uh, the body is really not being preserved. Uh, what it's basically doing is creating a, um, a nice little outer coating and everything just kind of deteriorates inside. And so they're really uh, basically a, a hollow shell. So we don't have any fully preserved mummies from the period of, of the time of the Old Kingdom. Uh, so we have hollow shells. We open them up uh, and it looked like they're complete because they have the outline that's still next. It's all stiffened up. And then we open it up and we think, oh, we're going we're to have a great, you know, toy surprise. And all we find inside is like these a few bones and fragments inside. And you're thinking, what happened? You know? Well, it's called not preservation. It didn't work. It's a failure. Uh, just, you know, you know, just like at first, uh, the early pyramids. But, you know, those Egyptians, they don't give up. So, but still. Uh, and they realize, they realize the fact that they're decaying during the time of the old kingdom that mummification at this point does not work don't worry it will later and i'll tell you exactly how you can preserve a body don't tell anybody i will give you the exact secret and you can write down the formula you know so you can you know do this for your friends and family <laughs> or, or, or or offer it to the uh uh the mortuary uh person in charge to hey can you do this Okay, <laughs> I want to be preserved forever. Okay, so what will happen is the uh, uh, first pharaoh of the sixth uh, dynasty, his name is Teti. Uh, he reigned from uh, uh, 2345 to 2333. He states as follows, or as stated for him, Awake, O king, raise yourself, receive your head, gather your bones together. Shake off your dust and sit on your iron throne so that you may eat the foreleg, devour the haunch, and partake of your rib joints in the sky in the company of the gods. You can't get any more colorful than that, right? <laughs> so he's realizing, yeah, we're, we're decaying here. Uh, uh, the Egyptians uh, also, uh, uh, there's another quote that goes as follows. I don't know why I'm doing this other one. I just want to do it. Oh, flesh of Teti, rot not, decay not, stink not. It's a hope. Uh, but it doesn't work out. So uh, the old kingdom, no. Uh, in fact, I mean, we do have a mummified hand uh, from Neferephrim, but uh, uh, from around 2450 BC, uh, the mummy's hand. Ooh. But uh, other than that, nothing from the old kingdom. So we get to the Middle Kingdom. Now we get to the Middle Kingdom. There we go. Things start to work out. Uh, and so strategies are changing, and they come up with what's called Natron, naturally. N-A-T-R-O-N. Natron. What is Natron? You want to write this down? Uh, so just, there it goes. So Natron is, first of all, a mixture of Sodium chloride. Wait, six, can anybody tell me what so sodium chloride is? Table oh. salt. Table salt. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Uh, sodium carbonate. Baking soda. Baking soda. Good, good. Sodium bicarbonate. Baking powder. Sodium sulfate. That's it. <laughs> I gave you the recipe. You know, uh, you know how do they do this? You know, I always love when people say, you know, we can never figure out, you know, how they preserve these mummies. What what chemicals they use? I'm thinking, you know, hello, anybody with a you know a basic knowledge of chemistry, <laughs> you know, can take a sample and figure it out. <laughs> hello. You know, uh, it's like it's very salty for, for a chemistry majors. It's like, hey, hello, hello, we can, we can do this here. And also the archaeologists, we can do this all along. But, you know, it makes for something dramatic uh, for the History Channel. We have yet to figure out how to preserve these mummies as they were in the past. Anyway, uh, oh well.
So what happens is that well, basically where they figure out this amazing formula. Well, Egypt is pretty hot and they use this to preserve their fish. <laughs> That's right. You gotta preserve the fish, it's gonna go bad. And then they then they applied it next to their animals and they thought, hey, if it works for fish and animals, maybe it'll work for people. So they're literally salting people, just like uh, beef jerky, you know? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> preserved. Okay, so uh, there you have it. Okay, so uh, so you dry you out. Now, um, it is a technique for preserving flesh. The Egyptians also realized that something else needs to go. Your brain. Yeah, you know, they, they you know, something's still rotting that's in your head. Uh, so um, it, it deteriorates uh, pretty quickly. So they figured out that uh, what they're going to do is they're going to crack open uh, your, your left nostril a little bit, kind of widen it up a little bit, and then they'll take a big hook and they'll pull out your brain piece by piece uh, until they get it all out. You know, just pull it all out, clear it up, because, you know, the brain is absolutely useless. We don't use it for anything, right? Uh, and then what will happen from there uh, is that uh, they will – heat resin uh, and sometimes pour it into the nostril to kind of fill up the cavity. Uh, although that doesn't become normalized until we get to the New Kingdom. So uh, so for a while during the Middle Kingdom, you're kind of empty-headed, light-headed. Uh, so, but uh, what will happen uh, is also what they will do uh, is they figured out a new technique. They will not only use the salting technique of Natron, but they will heat the resin and they'll put the resin, the, the, uh, the tree, uh, the, the plant sap on your skin first. And then they'll put the wrappings on. So you guys getting that? So you have, of course, the obviously first is the natron naturally. And then of course you have the sap. And then after that, you have the bandages. You, you have to have the sap eat it and then you put the put the bandages right over that and then you seal it on top of that with more resin that is going to help quite a bit and all of a sudden guess what we have uh we have mummies and they're preserved and it works it does uh and they get better at it uh especially during the time uh, of the new kingdom uh you know and uh and this is where they normalize the idea of pouring resin uh, into the head. And then we get uh, to around 1000 BCE uh, during the third intermediate period. And they start going, you know what? We're going to do a little bit more. We're going to put some padding in the cheeks to make it more natural. Unfortunately, the cheeks started to split pretty early on. So they changed their mind and they, they used regs. So uh, when the body is dry, dried out, they will put various regs under parts of the face in order to uh, keep it preserved, as well as other parts of the body. Uh, they will even put regs to uh, uh, help in other areas like bustle mass. And so there you have it. Are we okay so far? So you can see that the process of mummification uh, is really gradual. It really is. Um, there's a few other things I do want to mention is by the time of the New Kingdom into the uh, third intermediate period, uh, they come up with another technique that is amazing, uh, and that is onions. What they do is, is they put onions uh, under the eyes of the deceased uh, and under some of the wrappings. And, uh, of course, the onions represent Osiris. But uh, these are uh, onions are antibacterial in property. Uh, and, and, and you do apply it carefully. Uh, it really helps preserve the eyelids. So if you take a look at these mummies, you're going, wow, these, I mean, even their eyelids are preserved. When you see the older ones are all kind of chipped away, it's because they put onions under the eyes and it does, it works. So, okay, and of course, um, and now we're gonna go, of course, gonna go over next the, um, uh, the preservation. Now, uh, according to Herodotus, as well as others, there are three, different versions of mummification. You got the you got the deluxe, you got the intermediate, 
and you got the poor. <laughs> so it's whatever you can afford. So uh, if you got the deluxe, that's a pretty good one. That's a good package. Uh, and uh, Herodotus says as follows. He says, when a body is brought to the embalmers, they produce specimens, uh, model in wood, uh, grain and quality. They ask which of the three is required. And the family of the dead, having agreed upon a price, leave the embalmers to the test. The embalmer takes, uh, the embalming takes place in a special tent called an ibu, which means place of purification. Aradus describes, of course, uh, the more deluxe version and says, of course, as much as possible of the brain is removed via the nostrils with an iron hook and what cannot be reached with the hook is washed out with drugs. As I mentioned before, it is removed via the left nostril with a long hooked metal rod uh, that was 11.8 inches long, about 10, 30 centimeters. Uh, the rod first broke the brain into multiple parts uh, within the cranial cavity and then uh, takes piece by piece out through the nose. Uh, at, at this point, then they go into a chant. Uh, we do have some of these chants. Uh, I'll go ahead and read one before you become disenchanted. Uh, so here we go. Sorry, for chants. Okay. So, all right. So he says, uh, the, this is for the Bulak papyrus. It says, after this, anoint the head with myrrh. Uh, this is before, of course, you, you remove the brain. Now you're going to anoint the head with myrrh. Hope you're taking notes, right? Um, and uh, then you anoint it after a period of time a second time. And this time with an added oil known as the binding of the head. Under his head, then, it says, apply a layer of adhesive consisting of powdered myrrh and the oil of juniper. That's pretty specific. Okay, and then you're supposed to recite as follows. O oh, Osiris. Wait a second. I gotta be more authentic. It just doesn't seem right to say this. Without an actual Osiris from ancient times in my hand. Why not? Yeah, this is real. It is real. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, I, uh, my family inherited from another family uh, who collected it at the turn of the 1900s. So completely legal antiquity. <laughs> so, but here it is. You guys want to see it better? Than you, you see it all? I don't know if you can see it. But that's Osiris right there. Okay. It's a real Osiris. Uh, it's, not, it's, it's not really that old. I think it's... Um, Oh, I don't know. I, uh, it's it dates from 1,500 BCE. Is that old? I don't know. Is that is it? Anyone? Anyone? Yes, yes it is. Okay. Okay. So it's, it is 3,500 years old. Okay. Okay. So anyway, uh, here we go. Oh, Cyrus. Yes. Okay. Uh, oh, Cyrus. And then it says name of deceased inserted here. Okay. So you know they have it's a formula. So you gotta. I don't place the person's name. I'm not gonna, for for lots of reasons, I'm not gonna put any anybody's name there. It just doesn't seem right. Okay, so oh, Cyrus, name of the deceased, receive your head in the west, that you may enter among the ranks of the blissful transfigured. Your tomb has been appointed flawlessly, and it is provisioned exactly for you in the necropolis. Your name is illustrious in the workshop of the embalmers, for you praise the blissful transfigured. The dwellers of Duet, which is the underworld, kiss the earth before your corpse. The dwellers of heaven receive your bow. The dwellers of the earth give your praise. The dwellers of the valley cleanse your corpse. And Anubis and Horus render your embalmed, embalming most perfect. Toth makes your limbs sound through his utterances. O oh, you, Osiris, father of gods, insert name. You are vindicated before the royal tribunal, which is at Heliopolis, 
before the great gods of the temple of Ra, before the great tribunal, which is the temple of Ka. Your head will come to you and not apart from you. Uh, it will most surely come back to you and not apart from you eternally. There you go. Hey, how's that? And by the way, most likely this was discovered in the tomb. So this really adds to the uh, credibility. <laughs> see, see his arms are all crossed there. Yes. Of course, it, it broke at some point in time, so somebody tried to seal the. Uh, and of course, you can see the some of the hieroglyphics. Yeah. Is that cool? All right. Just kidding. <laughs> You're right. Wow. Uh -huh. okay. So, I mean, I'd show you my half or but uh, she's not part of the conversation. So, oh, bye bye. <laughs> okay. That's newer. That's from 1200 BC. Okay, so moving right along. Brand new. So they would say this. Next, uh, after that, Herodotus continues. Next, the flank is open with a flint knife. You know what the flank is. Uh, and the whole contents of the abdomen uh, removed. Of course, obviously, this is important because uh, the, the organs are quick to, to uh, decompose. The lungs, liver, stomach, and intestines were then uh, packed in natron, and they're dried out. Okay, after the drying process, the lungs, liver, stomach, and intestines were each wrapped in linen. Uh, and as I said before, in some cases, they're put into canopic jars. In some cases, they are wrapped and carefully placed back into the body. Uh, and uh, sometimes these organs were surrounded by sawdust, leaves, and other materials to make sure that they never touch the rest of the body uh, to uh, create uh, any sort of decomposition. Now, this is where it gets interesting. When it comes to the canopic jars, uh, you, they represent the four sons of Horus, Emseti, Happy, Dumatef, and Quibben Sinuf. Uh, and, um, and so each of these, and you may want to write this down because it is interesting. This, okay, so the son of Horus that protects the liver was Emsiti. Okay? And this is the one that has a human face on it, on the lid. So if you see one that has a human face on the lid, so if you go to a museum, you, or you're online, and you take a look at, at a canopic jar, and you see the one that has a human face on it, uh, that one, uh, excuse me, I'm taking up too much air, is M. Seti. Okay, and his special job is to help revive the corpse, uh, to resurrect it uh, in the next life, and his uh, a jar holds the liver. So he's connected uh, to the liver, of course, I do have a spell here uh, to empower uh, the resurrection of the body. Uh, it simply says, you have come to name a person. Betake yourself, meet him, and lift him up. Do not be far from him, name a person, in your name of Imseti. So there you have it. Uh, the goddess Isis is, in turn, the guard for Imseti. You guys got it? So the sons of Horus, right? Uh, the one that's guarding the liver is Emseti, and he's the one who helps revive the corpse as well. And he, in turn, Emseti is protected by Isis. Uh, he is connected also uh, to the direction of the south. So he's from the so the, the cardinal position of the south. The next uh, son of Horus is uh, Happy, or Happy. Uh, uh, Hoppy protects the lungs, and this is the one that is depicted with the face of the baboon. So if you see the, the, the baboon uh, as a face on the top of a canopic jar, this is the connection. Uh, obviously, the baboon is connected to Toth, which is the god of wisdom and knowledge. And so what, what Happy or Hoppy does is he makes the way clear for the deceased to pass through the underworld. So while uh, Imseti revives you and connected uh, to uh, the liver, 
Happy, who's connected to the lungs, is the one that gives you knowledge to go through the underworld. You guys got it? This is kind of cool. I know I love this. How, how, it's almost like a poetry to it. Uh, and, uh, and so that's that connection. And he is, um, um, sorry, going through, and, and uh, he is protected by Nephthys. Nephthys, of course, uh, who is uh, the one who, goddess who's in charge of dying. And he is related to the cardinal direction of the north. So, hey, we're learning a lot now. I mean, you can now go to a museum and you say, hey, hey you know, there's, there's, a, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a, a human face there. Uh, okay, so uh, that, that must be the, uh, who, who should that be? Who, who is that? Taking notes? Emseti. Okay. Okay. And you see the baboon, right? It's, it's uh, of course, happy. But the most interesting one is the third one. Dua Mutuf. D-U-A-M-U-T-E-F. Dua Mutuf. Uh, which, of course, protects the stomach. It has the face of a jackal. And uh, he is connected to the god Ni. And nothing is beneath her. She is the, uh, the great goddess that is connected to the primordial waters of creation. She is worshipped uh, as the god of, goddess of hunting and the war. Uh, she is, um, but she is connected to the stomach. Well, uh, obviously, she is also connected to the idea, sorry, uh, of helping uh, Dumatev uh, have the soul endure. But what I want to say is this. This is where it gets cool. Right. So, so you, you do realize that uh, for a long period of time, these jars actually contain these body parts. Right? So, you know, so if you are, uh, you know, you're excited. Can you imagine the old uh, grave robbers? Hey, this is going to be so great. <laughs> Look, there are probably like treasures in here and gold and jewels. And they put their arms in there and, oh, what's this? <laughs> it's all, ah, ah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know? Well, okay. But you don't want to, whatever you do, open the jar of Dumatech. Uh, especially because of me who protects the stomach. You see, she is a goddess connected to water, but also war. And warriors would pray to me before they went into battle to protect them. Why? You guys had noticed when it comes to Egyptian armor, the stomach is exposed. Oh, yeah, it's not very well protected. So who's going to protect the stomach? Neith is going to protect the stomach. So you don't have to worry. And so what happens is if somebody aims for the stomach, which of course people will do, uh, it's considered in many cases inappropriate to a battle etiquette. You know, that's not really fair. You're supposed to aim for what you can. But if you are, you know, if you do so anyway, guess what Neith does? Neith curses you. And Neith, what, what she will do is with her arrows, uh, will pursue you uh, in this life until you are dead. Because you're cursed. Uh-oh, you're getting the point where we're going with this one? Okay, so you don't want to upset Neith. Well, apparently the same goes for the afterlife. She doesn't have any, uh, it doesn't... There, there is no moment where, you know, she goes, okay, uh, you know, obviously uh, it's just during your lifetime. So if you are a grave robber and you violate this particular jar, you literally do have the curse of the mummy. It, this is where we get the curse ideas. Is this interesting? Uh, and that curse will follow you uh, to the ends of your life, which, according to the Egyptians, will not be very long. So there you have it. So so you can violate all the uh, all the jars you want. <laughs> you know, you really shouldn't do any of that. 
Uh, but if you get to one that has the face of a jackal, beware. All right, one more. By the way, oh, I should say that uh, uh, Benetov is connected to the east. Finally, uh, the final one is Quebesinef or Senef, uh, Q E B E H S E N U E F. You mean he did say it, say it right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What a great word. Uh, basically, uh, this has a head of a falcon. Uh, and this is the part that refreshes the soul. So one revives, one guides, one endures, and one refreshes. One is, you know, like I said, it is poetry, is it not? Uh, connected to the sons of Horus, uh, each with their special goddess uh, that protects the goddess of Selket is the protector. Uh, this is the healing deity of stings as well as bites. In fact, the word Selket means she who causes the throat to breathe is what her name means. Uh, and she is known to protect uh, us from the mighty snake of Apophis. And uh, the cardinal direction connected with this star is, of course, the west. So you can see there is significance to all of these. Uh, they, can, they did keep the tradition going with these jars for a long period of time. Even when they started having the tradition of bringing the intestines uh, in the stomach and the liver uh, back into the body and wrapping it and putting sawdust around it, they still had these jars uh, because they still represented these ideas. So even the theory uh, was uh, continued on. Okay, so we continue. So while the entrails are packed in natron, uh, uh, Herodotus continues, the cavity is then thoroughly cleaned and washed out, first with palm wine and then ground spices. After that, it is filled with pure myrrh, cassia, and every kind of aromatic substance, except for frankincense, which is to be burned, not placed in the body there which is different from the Arabic tradition, as well as the traditions of the Middle East. It's kind of throwing that one in there. Uh, and sewn up again, after which the body is placed in natron, covered over entirely for 70 days, seven zero days, the body is covered in natron. So there you have it. Um, yep. And of course, uh, after uh, they split this up in two halves, uh, two parts, uh, so you have uh, the you have 40 days and you have 30 days, uh, but uh, the whole you know so basically it's a natron all 70, but you still have 40 days to do certain things and then 30 days after so they take it out put it back and again it's a big pile of natron. By the way, that's a lot of natron and that's kind of expensive, so you can see why this is the, the deluxe version of it. Uh, but what they will do is after the first 40 days they take it out temporarily from the natron pile. Uh, and they wash it in Nile water, and then the flesh is rubbed with oil to retain some of the elasticity of the skin. The rags are removed. The embalmers then fill the empty cavity with sawdust, leaves, and linen, and various herbs, but they still retain the earlier wonderful scent that was placed in originally, so it just kind of marinated. And then all at that point, uh, they... Um, they put it back into the natron and they keep doing this back and forth for the next uh 30 days why why are they doing that well what they're doing is it's not time to start slowly wrapping the body but obviously if you have it out the whole time it's going to rot so you have to do this in chips you got to be practical so they'll wrap a section put it back in the natron wrap a section and put it back in the natron it just makes sense it's a long time why does it take so long because every time they wrap a bandage. Every bandage section has their own special set of hymns that have to be sung and spells that have to be done for every part, and that takes forever. So, you know, good luck with that. So you start off, the embalmers, uh, they start by wrapping the head, you know, and that process will take a few days, back, forth, back, forth, and there's special spells that connect with the head. Then they move from there uh, to the neck. So the head and neck is wrapped first. After that, they start with the hands. 
and they wrap each individual finger, and you won't believe this, but each finger has its own special smell as you wrap each finger and magic in order to protect it. You know, these, these guys, they better be well paid. They're not, but you know, <laughs> a lot of patience to wrap a body. Uh, what happens after the fingers is they move up the hand, then they move up the arm, uh, and then after that, they start with the toes and they start all over again, and then they move up from there, the leg uh, and through the thigh, and only after all of that do they, they wrap up the torso part. That's the last part to go because they're doing all these kinds of things uh, with the torso. So there you have it. Uh, they, they do put uh, magical amulets under the wrappings. Okay, so um, what will happen is, is these magical amulets, they help bring the body back to life. And, and also they help protect the spirit for its journey into the afterlife. Uh, they oftentimes they use what's called an Isis knot, uh, known as a tie it. So you tie it, there it is. And the tie it uh, is oftentimes used to uh, fasten garments, but is also connected to the blood of Isis. So it's a symbol of her menstrual blood, but also her blood that connects to regeneration. And so the idea is, is that they will wrap, they will put this amulet under the, the um, uh, wrappings. And then of course, you know, they'll proclaim, you possess your blood, Isis. You possess your power, Isis. You possess your magic, Isis. Uh, and of course, the amulet is a protection for this great one, which would drive off anyone who would perform a criminal act against them." End quote. That's one of the, giving you the spells. You want a specific, so I'm giving you it. So this is one of the, one of the things that they will say, uh, it also protects the body from decomposition. Another uh, a popular one is called a plummet, uh, and it looks like a, a capital A, uh, and it is meant to bring balance in life. Of course, you're dead, but uh, it's it's the balance for the afterlife. And uh, another one is the scarab. The scarab is often wrapped under the bandages. Uh, as you know, the Egyptians uh, uh, view the scarab as connected to the dung beetle. For they observe that the dung beetle submerges into the sand and then after some time being hidden, will reemerge magically with many beetles. Obviously, you know, this one beetle doesn't become many. Uh, this, there, there's no beetle mania. But what will happen uh, is that, uh, oh, you gotta stop these, uh, what will happen is that they it will have babies, but they assume that it goes from the simple to the multiplicity. It goes from the idea of, of, of a simple beginning to life abundantly. And so the dung beetle is looked at that way. Um, okay, after all that, we're not done yet. Is this great? You guys are actually hearing exactly how they mummify, you know. I mean, you can now go out there and you can go mummify a body. Hey, how's that? <laughs> uh, so these volunteers? Okay, it's always my way. All right. So from there, what will happen is, uh, oh yeah, uh, you now you gotta, you gotta, after doing the wrapping, you tie the legs together. And next you tie the arms together, just below the elbows in front. And what do you do with that? Well, I guess you gotta put something in those hands. And so they'll put what's called the Book of the Dead in those hands in many cases. Now, I gotta tell you, the idea of the Book of the Dead, at first, uh, the wealthy people had it. It started during the Old Kingdom into the Middle Kingdom. And of course, it's known as the coffin texts. And the idea is you're dead, you're rich. And all you have to do is after you die, you open your eyes in your elaborate, wonderful coffin and you're able to read the instructions of how to go into the afterlife, complete with all the magical spells that you need. You know, the people other than wealthy people didn't think this was very fair. <laughs> they get instructions and we have to stumble through it. <clears throat> and so there became a demand for a more, you know, a, a, a book of the dead for everybody, which was then written in a book. And this book was placed 
um, on the chest or where the arms are, and this would became the, becomes the guide. So in this case, uh, you wake up after you die, uh, and you go ahead and read this this text. And it'll tell you because you got to make sure you got you got to memorize all the magical formula to get through the various levels of the underworld. <clears throat> that means that I'm sorry, you thought homework was over, <laughs> and you thought memorization is over. Nope. When you die, you got some homework to do. You got to start memorizing all the magic words because if you slip up, you're not getting to that special chamber where they're going to weigh your heart. And there are there are texts that talk about you just simply being lost. <laughs> so that's not good. You're not going to even be swallowed by a mint. At least at least let me die with with dignity and be swallowed for all eternity uh, in the jaws of death. No, uh, you'll just simply be forgotten. So you got to make sure. You do well with this. In uh, some cases, I got to tell you, the book, the book of the, uh, the Dead, there's all different versions. Uh, a lot of the versions are like Mad Libs. You have empty spaces here and there where you kind of place your name in different places. And sometimes you even place different instruments that you're going to be using. Hey, you know, you just got to make it, you know, user friendly. So there's actually people who are manufacturing these in mass, these scribes. <laughs> and, and, and creating places for them. But these also, Book of the Dead, they don't always match up as a text. Sometimes you have like a really mini version that uh, basically goes right under your wrappings. Uh, it's like just a few words, you know, and little symbols on there, and then they just throw you in the hole. That's for the, that's for the real low budget uh, modification. That's the third level, you know. Uh, but in other cases, it's more elaborate. But yeah, so, so you read this Book of the Dead, it's pretty great uh, because what happens is that from there you memorize it and you finally get uh, through all the gods, demons, and spirits of the underworld. They're all basically pleased or repulsed or appeased via the selection of power words. Uh, and finally, you have the weighing of the heart ceremony uh, before King Osiris. There you go. Uh, we'll have to bring bring King Osiris series back again. I'm sure you know uh, in in a even non humorous way. This is, this is pretty kind of cool. You think about it. Uh, okay, so here's Osiris. There he is. Uh, so what happens is that uh, before Osiris, uh, you are judged uh, and mocked the goddess of truth, Anubis, the jackal headed god, is also there, and your heart is weighed uh, with, of course, uh, Anubis uh, holding the balance, and it's weighed against the feather. So if, you, if your heart is lighter than a feather, you are light-hearted, that's where it comes from, then you go into this wonderful place of paradise where the northern wind blows, uh, there's you know, tall grass everywhere, which they have a lot of in Egypt. <laughs> they have, of course, a wonderful battle, this uh, river, which, of course, they again have in Egypt. All these fancy birds flying around, good hunting. You know, it's, it, it mirrors home, okay? <laughs> uh, but the part I like uh, in many texts they talk about is that when you arrive upon the shores of this, of this other life, almost like crossing the river Styx, except it's idyllic, your loved ones are there waiting for you. And the best part, your animals. They do mention your cats. They really do. I'm not kidding. They mention your cats. They even mention your dogs as waiting for you. Now, of course, there's some there's some problems here to, from a theological standpoint because uh, here's the, here's the interesting part. If your heart is heavy-hearted, right? So if you did not do what is righteous, then you're thrown into the jaws of Amit. To be digested for the next thousand years. Uh, this is the this this line, by the way, George Lucas took for Return of the Jedi uh, when Boba Fett got you know got swallowed up. Yeah, you know. Okay, yeah, that that that, that big big, big draw thing. Yeah, he's he's quoting Egyptian mythology. Oh, thank you, Lucas. Anyway, uh, you know who cares if you're digested for over a thousand years? I mean, you're going to be dead right away. You know, that's, that's kind of prolonged. But anyway, but the problem is from a theological standpoint is if you had been bad and swallowed up and you have to be one of those loved ones who, you know, if, you're, if you've been good and you're arriving at that shore, 
this is all your loved ones. Well, what if you had a bad loved one? <laughs> Do they like recreate a facsimile of him? <laughs> you know, you know, a parallel universe? Or what if you just had a bad cat? You know, okay, maybe not. Uh, there are no bad cats, right? Okay, so there you go. So thank you, Anubis. You, you, we'll, we'll have you again uh, a little bit here. Okay, so there you have it. And, uh, by the way, and Toth then records everything down. Well, what happens next, I think is pretty sad. And that is the rich people get mad. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see, uh, see the wealthy people, they have the coffin text, which is the band of dead. And now all these, these regular people, these commoners, uh, they have the Book of the Dead too. That doesn't make them feel very special. So they decide to come up with uh, their own special book, which is like the fast pass. Uh, it's, the, it's the better way to get uh, to the underworld and you get there faster and more successfully. Isn't human nature interesting? So, and, and according to it, uh, the omelet is not to be used for commoners. It's only for the wealthy people because they can, they can afford it. So the omelet um, uh, goes as follows. It's used for pharaohs, priests, uh, and um, basically this work describes in detail the journey of the sun god Ra through the underworld just after the sun sets in the west to just before the sun rises in the east. Pharaoh was believed to make the same journey after he died, joining Ra's a celestial barge. The underworld is, is portrayed as being divided into 12 parts, and each part representing an, an hour of the night, the 12 hours of the night, each of the 12. So as a person descends each hour, right, you enter each level and you further go down and down. Uh, the Anduit, of course, uh, the idea is you have to memorize the name of each god or daemon uh, that is in charge of each of the levels as you go down, and then as you go back up again. The, I'll, I'll give you details because you look interested. The first hour of the night is the time of transition when Ra as the sun descends into the western horizon, known as Akhet. Uh, in the second hour, Ra encounters the watery world called Burns. This realm of water continues into the third hour, where it encounters the waters of Osiris. The fourth region of the underworld, uh, you arrive at the desert regions known as Sokar, the hawk deity. Ra then has to navigate a treacherous zigzag path as he is dragged upon a snake boat. In the fifth hour, the sun reaches the tomb of Osiris, which is covered by a giant pyramid-shaped mound declared as Isis covering Osiris. Over the summit of the pyramid, Isis and Nephthys fly about as two birds, uh, Egyptian birds of prey known as kites. Beneath this tomb lies a great lake of fire. Uh, for those who are unrighteous, they get thrown into the lake of fire. During the sixth hour, the soul of Ra, called, called in this text the Ba, unites with his body which is the precise moment that the sun begins its regeneration uh, into the realm of the light. Uh, and then the seventh hour, uh, uh, your soul faces Apophis, the great dragon of old, and you defeat them with Ra's help, and eventually you rise again, and you are resurrected. Yay, there you did it. So uh, this is the Omduit. Uh, so you're thinking, okay, <laughs> the wealthy people are going, this is great. It's great for pharaohs. And the common people said, you know what? That's not fair. So guess what they did? Oh, you're not going to believe this one. They created their own common book to compete with the Omduit, known as the Book of Bates, <laughs> which is the poor man's version of the Omduit. <laughs> so, so for this one, oh, you can't make this up. And it also has the 12 hours of the day, and you go into the underworld, but it's done even, it's even more easy to go through because the Book of the Dead is really complicated. This one is, uh, the Omduit is more organized, you know, 12 hours. You know, once you're through, you're resurrected, but you still have to memorize all this, face all these challenges. <laughs> and the common people says, we don't want to do any of that. <laughs> what we're going to do is that each level uh, is a goddess. 
And um, we just say the goddess name and we enter the next level. Say the next goddess name, we enter the next level. Isn't that great? And these goddesses, we don't know what, uh, sorry, we don't, we, uh, I should say this this way. These are goddesses that are not big goddesses of the Egyptians, but most scholars agree that these are the goddesses that represent the constellations of the sky represented by each hour as they move through. And so basically uh, that's all you have to do. After the 12 hours of the night, you're done. So I have to say, give it to the common people, you know, they figure it out a better way. <laughs> okay. Uh, are, are you learning too much? Is this, is this okay? Okay, so we keep on going. So are we over yet? Well, no. Where's, there's more because after wrapping everything, uh, and of course you put the book of the book of the dead in the person's hand, and after yes, tying the arms and the legs, uh, it's time to do some more. Uh, according to Herodotus, uh, uh, they will pour now liquid resin to, to over the bandages to hold, help hold it together, uh, and then in some cases they'll put a second cloth on top, and then if that's not enough. They're going to even put a grave mask over it, or they will put a painting of the person. And in some cases, it's a painting that they actually had help hanging up in their home, uh, and they just slap it onto the mummy. In other cases, uh, it is something that is, is, is literally painted over the face. This is really fun because you can tell if you go, like, for example, to the Getty or you go to any other place. You can tell which ones were the ones painted at home, you know, the ones that were in life, and then they press it upon the deceased, and you can tell the ones they painted from scratch on the deceased. Uh, so basically, they have somebody to look for, look look at. In some cases, though, they'll, they'll even just uh, paint the face on top of the ratting, wrappings, which, by the way, looks really creepy because uh, the paint cracks, it's on wrappings, and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> so... Uh, there you have it. Uh, but uh, okay, well that's it for for that part. So that's the wealthy way of being wrapped up. What do you think? So what about the intermediate? You know, I can't afford that. <laughs> that's too expensive. Well, of course, uh, the second quality uh, is as follows, and I'm going to read it straight from Herodotus. He says, um, in this case, uh, when for reasons of expense. Uh, this is what he's saying. The second quality um, is called for. The treatment is different. No incision is made, and the intestines are not removed. The oil of cedar is injected with a syringe into the body through the anus, which is afterwards stopped up to prevent the liquid from escaping. <clears throat> the body is then cured in natron for the prescribed number of days, you know, 70 days, and on the last of which the oil is drained off. The effect of it is so powerful that as it leaves the body, it brings with it the viscera in liquid state uh, as the flesh has been dissolved by the natron. Nothing in the body is left but the skin and bones. After this treatment, uh, it is returned to the family without further attention. So basically what they do is they liquefy your interior. Done. <laughs> and goes back. Now, if you can't afford that, well, uh, then Herata says, quote, the third method used for embalming the bodies of the poor is simply to wash out the intestines and keep the body for 70 days in natron. That's it. It's over. Okay, so after all of that, okay, now we have to deal with the various, we have to revive the mummy. So before they, 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 they uh, 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 for the deluxe, the intermediate, even the poor, before you throw the poor body into the hole, you still have to have some kind of opening of the mouth ceremony uh, so it can live again, so it can start the journey into the underworld. You can start memorizing your cliff notes. And you can start, oh, yeah, I, I gotta figure out how this, this works. You gotta do it. Uh, so, uh, now, and so there's a chanting, there's an opening of the mouth ceremony that is performed. And during this period of time, the ba and the ka are reunited as one. The ba and the ka. Now, 
you're going to, of course, ask me. So the, the, the Egyptians have two aspects of the soul. No, they have five. Here we go. The Egyptians have as follows. First of all, they have the red. The red is the part of the soul that's connected with your name. So the minute you are named, there is a spirit essence that's formed that has a power over you that makes you do things. Think about it. When somebody calls your name, you react, right? So there's got to be some kind of power. So, so they assume that there is. So what they will do is they will make sure your name is protected. If you are wealthy, uh, you're up there, uh, what they will do is they'll take your name and they'll surround it by this magical formula to make sure that nobody desecrates it. That's the cartouche. That's that rope that goes around it and that protects the name. So you can't, uh, you can't make the Pharaoh do anything because he's got that cartouche around his name and uh, so you can't order Ramses to do anything, right? <laughs> He's well protected. Uh, then, of course, the next thing uh, that you have uh, is the, the shoot. Uh, S-H-E-U-T. It's your shadow. Uh, your shadow follows you everywhere you go. And so there is a spirit essence there. Uh, you always got to worry about somebody who does not cast the shadow. But, uh, you know, but there you have it. The next is a very interesting one. It's called an ib. The ib is the metaphysical heart. The metaphysical heart that connects with your physical heart. So the spirit of the ib is in your actual heart. This is why you keep your actual heart in your body, because the ib is connected to it. Is this making sense? It is, the ib is your anchor to the physical world. So while the ba and the ka uh, will connect together with the ak in the afterlife somewhere above, there's still an anchor through the heart in your physical body, and it's the ib that anchors it. Does, does that make sense? So, yeah, so it's the ib that is that. Uh, there is, of course, the ib connects with feelings. It does connect with emotions. Uh, so um, uh, if you are your ot ib, uh, that means you have a wild wideness of heart. But if you're hurt, you are cob ib, which means you have a truncated heart. So heart is connected to happiness. It's connected to sadness. Uh, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, if you've been bad, your metaphysical ib is swallowed by the uh, great dragon, the great serpent of old, the great uh, uh, image of death, uh, Amit, and that's the end of it. Sorry. But uh, there you have it. There's a rhyme there. You, you think you missed it for no rhyme or reason. So what will happen is, is the Ib is there. Now, that leaves us with two, uh, two things, and that's the Ba uh, and the Ka. The Ba is the individual personality. It's who what makes you who you are. And the, uh, the uh, from there, the Ka is your vital essence. It is the spark of life that enables you to live. It's the birth of life. So the ba and the ka, who you are, and the vital essence of, of, of life combine together and become known as the ah, and that is in the realm of the afterlife. And, but your heart is still connected uh, you know, via the ib in your physical body. This is why the preservation of your body was 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 so looked after this is why you don't want the the body to be desecrated because this is your anchor to this realm is this making sense now it doesn't mean that without the ib you don't have emotions because the ak connects to the higher emotions but still the ib is your anchor to this life okay so when you die the ka leaves the body but through the opening of the mouth ritual, the Ba is released and permitted to join the Ka. And they, as I said before, they connect and become the Ak. Ultimately, uh, the, the, they are, they're believed to merge together uh, with Osiris. All right, and then of course, from there, the mummy is then carried uh, into the burial chamber or the mummy is placed into the ground. It just depends. Then you put what's called excretion texts 
Uh, these are sometimes these are ritual bowls, cursing bowls to protect the body. You got to add some curses. So if you you know if you're not gonna if you're not gonna mix up with the uh, stomach jar, you still have some extra curses you have to get through. You can see why this is a problem. And then of course uh, you're put in there and you're placed in the tomb, and it's filled with a whole bunch of uh, possessions if you're wealthy that you're gonna take with you, or it is, um, you know, it's wrapped with you or it's thrown in the ground with you. But uh, there's something else that you got to have, after all. Uh, and that is uh, you have what's called a Shabbatus. A Shabbatus uh, basically started out a long time ago. Uh, these are figurines positioned to stand guard over the corpse. Uh, the Shabbatist was intended as a substitute for those who were sacrificed before. Uh, he has a long story, really short, and we have their bodies. <laughs> when, when, a, when a pharaoh, uh, was, um, when a pharaoh was, uh, was buried, uh, they would bury people with him, you know. Uh, and um, that, was, that was not exactly that popular. In fact, I actually have the numbers. I'm going to read this for fun. Okay, so I'm going to go through some pharaohs. I'll give you the statistics. So pharaohs are buried with servants and staff who were originally killed to go with them into the afterlife. So we have discovered that a Didger, uh, he was buried with 318. Digit was buried with 174. Den was buried with 136, as noticed in the pattern. Ajib was buried with 64. <laughs> and look, it's like one of those things, it's like, Pharaoh is getting sick. I think he's dying. You know, it's time for me to find another job. <laughs> another source of income. Uh, I don't know. I don't know why. I just have this inspiration. I'm going to work for uh, somebody else. And the numbers keep going down. Uh, and they're realizing this is not really popular. Uh, in fact, it's pretty funny. I'm, I'm actually naming these pharaohs from the old kingdom in exact order. So what will happen is we get to... Um, um, uh, Semerkert, who's next, 67 additional tombs were added. And so, in other words, they're allowed to live out their lives uh, and uh, then buried afterwards. So, but you've got to have somebody now to attend to not just the Pharaoh, but to others. So instead of having dead people who were either ritually slaughtered or just put there alive and they killed each other and cracked their necks open, and we have actually, we actually have forensics of fights within these tombs where they just, they, they put them in there and they kill themselves. But anyway, uh, what will happen is they will actually make a life-size image of a servant to go with you in the afterlife, not only for Pharaoh, but for, well, for, uh, for, for nobles. And, you know, people get cheap after a while. These life-size ones are, are pretty, uh, pretty big. Uh, they're known as Shabbatists, which are answerers. And your name, it's personalized, is placed on it. And uh, you say the name, and that, that, that Sabbatus will be with you wherever you go. Yes, I have one. This is a real Sabbatus. It's a real thing. Yeah, that's right. There it is. Yeah, this one is, is also about 3,500 years old. Uh, and then what happened is it was, it was buried, and then it has water damage. You can see where they would put the, the magic word back here. They have a place for it. Uh, and then later on, uh, uh, somebody must have reused it, and they reused it as a voodoo doll. That's why it has, like, all these pinpricks through it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> secondary usage. Is this interesting? So, yeah, too bad. This is not in person. I would let you touch it. You know, shop at this. Okay, so what will happen there is they'll perform, do whatever you want. Okay, so we have, I know we're running out of time. I'm looking at it. What I think is super cool how many, how many seconds I have, five minutes, uh, is that we have the bodies of some of the most famous pharaohs. We actually do. Uh, and and uh, so we take a look. We have the body of Tutmos II, uh, who is, uh, we have, you know, the famous pharaoh Hatshepsut? We have her body. I mean, that's great. So we take a look at her, and uh, we do a CT scan. Uh, and we take a look, and uh, we realize that, uh, and other things, uh, first of all, uh, basically, she has an overbite. 
Uh, she liked to have, she, her nail polish is black and red. Uh, uh, she had many skin legions, extensive tooth decay, uh, but they took a look at, and it's because of an insulin problem as opposed to bad eating habits because she had diabetes. And she had a skin disease known as alopecia. That's why she was bald in front, like me. Hey, okay. So that's hatchet set. So we know ex we knew what, she, what she looks like because we found her body. Isn't that great? Okay, we take a look at another, you know, Kananatan. You know, this is a monotheistic hero, uh, uh, and uh, he always makes himself look like an alien, elongated head, real long arms, strange face, white pelvic bone. Uh, what did he really look like? Did he really look like an alien, uh, an extraterrestrial? Well, the reality is, is that uh, Kananatan did have a rather long head. Not super long, but long enough to go, yeah, the guy has like a, have a long head. So apparently he's like a, like, a, like a caricature of a cartoon. He exaggerated his long head. Uh, we take a look at him also, and he does have a prominent chin. So he really does have that chin. Oh, he does. His arms are unusually long, and his legs are unusually long. So he is he is kind of a strange bird if you take a look at his body. But as far as anything else, like his pelvic bone and all that, we don't know because somebody smashed the rest of the mummy. And I'm sorry. It's too bad. Uh, we have Tutankhamen, of course. Uh, Tutankhamen, interestingly enough, uh, he was not buried with his heart. They put a replacement in it, which many people say, uh, we know this from other uh, texts and, and other uh, customs. If your heart was bad in life, you don't want to have a bad ticker in the afterlife. So it could mean that uh, Tutankhamun uh, had a weak heart. And so that's why they replaced it. Uh, Tutankhamun was, uh, we know, is related to uh, Akhenaten. We have his body. We can do the genetics. Uh, yes, so uh, direct uh, relationship, uh, son. Uh, we, we also, we take a look at this, and um, we realize that uh, it looks like Tutankhamun had some kind of accident or something happened in the pelvic area. Some people say that he fell off a chariot. Some people that say that he was in battle and he got injured there. Other people say, no, uh, that's not what happened, because what they did is they covered his whole body with black tar and resin uh, because he wanted to be the new Osiris. Uh, because he was uh, resurrecting the polytheistic system, undoing the monotheistic system of his father, and a fire happened and burned the tar, and because of the heat, it cracked the bone in his pelvic region. So there are many different theories going on, although we know that he made sure that he was very well in health. Uh, uh, you know, so there's some connection there, a little showing off his, his, his Horus aspect, uh, but uh, yeah. And then, of course, we do have the body of Ramses, uh, the great Ramses II. Isn't that great? We have his body. We know what he looks like. He's foot, five foot seven inches tall. Uh, he had arthritis. Uh, we know he has, uh, once again, uh, the, these Egyptians have a strange uh, muzzle face. And he definitely had that. Uh, a murder mystery was solved in the case of Ramses III, they weren't, weren't sure if he was killed or not. Uh, it was a mystery amongst the ancient Egyptians. We have his body, and we realize that his neck was slit. So it does answer that question. We also know that uh, the Egyptians did mummify their pets. <clears throat> they mummified them. I know, uh, just give me a few seconds, I'll give you the four reasons why they mummified their pets. The first reason is they love their animals. And they want them to go with them in the afterlife. And that's, that, that kind of gets you right here. That's right. You mummify your cat. You mummify your dog. You mummify your, your pet gazelle. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> Ibis. He has some very strange pets. But secondly, unfortunately, uh, the animals were mummified as ritual offerings uh, to be given. So they will kill them and use it as ritual offerings. However, I want to say this. This is pretty funny. They keep finding these so-called ritual offerings of these pets, and they they find the shape, and they open it up, and they find nothing but like straw or some rocks inside. So apparently, a lot of Egyptians are not doing their job. 
<laughs> supposed to be buried. They're supposed to be having a real animal in there, and, there, and a lot of them don't have a real animal at all. They stuff it with feathers. So I, I can picture these Egyptians going, I can't do this. <laughs> uh, okay. uh, the third reason is to provide nourishment for those who are going into the afterlife, which so they're buried as food. Uh, and finally, uh, they are uh, connected to various gods uh, and, 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 and goddesses. Uh, and so, so the animals that represent the god or goddess are especially raised uh, and then offered in their specific temples at a, at a, a certain period of time. Uh, and, and, and of course, other parts are meant to feed, obviously, those who are the priests and priestesses. Uh, so there you have it. So mummification, uh, I think I uh, really covered uh, this topic pretty well, uh, completely, right? And of course, I guess simply, it's a wrap. Hey. I'm done. Exactly. <laughs> okay, there we go. Woo. All right, do you feel like you uh, uh, have received uh, enough information? Was that good? Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Oh, well, before we have questions, I want to take a picture of everybody before they all leave. So if you, if you have the ability to show yourself, to reveal yourself to me, uh, then um, I'll turn your, your cameras on and, um, and your names will go down in history. So ready? Are we all there? Okay, we'll go right now. One, two, oh, more people are showing up. Okay. Any more wanting the show? Only once? Going twice? Okay. One, two, and three. Okay, wonderful. Mm -hmm. Now, questions? Well, I had two. Um, one, do we have any idea whose heart they replaced the Pharaoh's heart with? Was it just a random? No, a fake heart. Oh, just fake. Okay, it's not an a... Absolutely fake heart, yeah. Oh. Okay. So, yeah, yeah, it's, it's a phony. Yeah, okay. so um, you have a made-up heart made out of different kinds of things. Sometimes it's metallic, a metal heart. Uh, sometimes it is made out of something else. It's uh, sometimes a stone. Sometimes it's made out of clay. Yeah. Huh. So, yep, but it's, uh, but what happened is they don't want to give a, uh, you know, I mean, obviously a bad replacement, but I'm, I'm sure in some cases, the person who's doing the mummification is, oops, <laughs> sorry, you know, <laughs> If you guys uh, know anything about uh, autopsies, sometimes they, you know, things get messed up. You're removing things. You're removing those lungs and, well, okay, that didn't work out. Um, but um, uh, there's always a human element. But uh, a lot of people will say uh, that it is uh, because the heart is weak and they'll replace it with something that will work. And, um, yeah, any other questions? I had one more. Um, did they put natron or resin or anything in the canopic jars, or were they fine with your viscera just rotting? They're, what, what they will do in, in some cases is they will take your intestines, for example, uh, and they will they'll naturalize it, uh, and then they will wrap it up, uh, and they will put it into the jar, and then they will surround it by uh, sawdust, uh, and aromatics and other kinds of things to make it smell good. But, it, you know, so yeah, but it really depends. Uh, and the funny thing is, is that when it comes, it comes to canopic jars, there is so much in the way of diversity of how they do it. Uh, because as I mentioned, they, they started out with a chest, then they became jars, and they have obviously the, the, the heads of horses, sons, but in some cases, and I've seen one personally, uh, they just throw it in there with nothing. <laughs> so sometimes they just let it slop on in. And I saw one of these, and I'm like, well, they really didn't care. <laughs> it's like, okay. And in other cases, uh, they will be all careful and pat it in. I guess they figure nobody's going to look in there to figure out if they did quality control. <laughs> you know? Um, and, uh, but, I, but I do notice, I'm going to answer your question a little bit more, is that in very special like the more, more uh, the pharaohs that are in very are, are important, I notice that everything is done pretty well. Good quality job. So maybe they do have some somebody inspecting. But uh, some of the little known pharaohs that are not as good, short lived ones during the, the third intermediate period, uh, the cheap knockoff situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, Stephanie wants to know, would they only remove the brain through the left, left nostril? So wait, okay. So I look at the chat here. Yes, only through the left nostril. Uh, and there is, um, and it's it goes back to mythologies that have to do with the breath going through the right, and then that which exhales from the to the left. So it's, a, it's a superstition, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure there's exceptions. I mean, again, who's going to be caring? You know, you know. Um, I have seen, and I think we all have seen, but uh, there are situations where the nose is broken, the septum is broken. <laughs> so what you know, sometimes it gets broken because, well, you know, it just gets chipped off because the nose sticks out. But in other cases, it looks like they got a little sloppy with that hook. So. Any other questions? Nice. How much of all of these processes did they use on the pets? Like they're mummifying a cat. Did they remove everything and put them in little jars? Or what What all did they do for it? You animals? know, that would be so cute. <laughs> I, I, can picture, I can picture like a little cat, you know, and you have these like little canopic jars, you open it up, you know, but no. No, unfortunately, uh, they're, they're, they're for a, a mummification uh, would be the more of the uh, the second as well as the, the third version. You know, liquefy the middle, but most of it is the, is the third one. You just you know bury it. I mean, wrap it up. Uh, but uh, well, but I will say something else. Some of these are very well preserved, and you're thinking to yourself, but wait a second, they're not wrapped up very well. Yeah, but sometimes they bury them in shallow sand. And we're back to the beginning uh, around 5000 BCE, you know, where they're, you know, in these kinds of climates that have preserved them. So, you know, because they're pets. So I'm uh, just throwing that one in too for fun. But uh, yeah, uh, so the cheap version, liquefy or just simply do a wrap. You know, they found a whole bunch of these. Uh, uh, they found one time. I want to look at my notes here for this because I want to give you the, 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 the some of the number here. Uh, at least if, if I can find it, or maybe I won't be able to find it. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, no, I guess it won't. They found a whole bunch of these. Oh yeah, here it is. Uh, in 1888, they found 80,000 mummified cats and kittens. 80,000, uh, dating from 2000 to 1000 BCE. The British, uh, what they did is they uh, basically shipped these cat mummies back to uh, uh, England, and they used it as fertilizer. Oh. So those British, I tell you. <laughs> yeah. So, but uh, yeah, they, they keep discovering pets all the time. Eighty thousand is quite a few. Yes. Any other questions? Right. All right. Wow. I seem to have answered all the questions. Wonderful. Well, then I shall close it up. And I will say thank you so much uh, for being here. And apparently next time I'm going to be doing the seven wonders of the ancient world. And so we're going to be going through them, the great pyramids, uh, you know, going through the, the obviously, the uh, lighthouse of Alexandria, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Temple of Artemis, the Colossus of Rhodes, the Great uh, Throne of Zeus uh, at Olympia. Uh, it's going to be uh, a pretty, pretty fun time uh, because what it is, to make it even more interesting, uh, is Alexander the Great's empire. Um, you know, uh, really unified much of the world. And a new breed of person started to arise in this unified world. It's called the tourist. <laughs> That's right. And so the Seven Wonders is all about ancient tourism. And so we're going to be talking about 
uh, that perspective uh, and uh, really bring that to life where uh, some people, uh, when, you, when you arrive at the site, you even have little collectibles that you pick up at the various sites. You collect them all. I'm not kidding you. This is, so it will be a fun talk. Uh, so we will go into that next time. Uh, the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World. Uh, and again, have a great night. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.